Hello, everybody. Welcome to our sixth fireside chat for the Vercel AI Accelerator. Uh, today, we have uh, Lara and Connor here with us from Stability AI. Uh, they're going to talk to us about um, a little bit about stability in general, their uh, their models and how to access them, uh, and also show us a little preview of an upcoming launch at the end. So thank you so much for being here, Lara and, and Connor, and take it away. Alrighty, Laura, um, do you mind resharing that link with me to the Google Drive we had? Sorry, I just grabbed that. There we go. Actually, I think I got it. A little bit discombobulated. We launched uh, SDXL 1.0 today, which has been quite exciting. Um, hopefully, uh, everyone has got a chance to check that out and see see what's going on there. Uh, let's I just saw it. Share. Yeah, congrats. All right. Let me know if we are good. Are you all good? All good. Sweet. Um, yeah, so I'll start off just introducing myself a bit, what I do at Stability. Um, man, that's hard to define, actually. Uh, so I work on quite a lot of random things. Uh, it's been Dream Studio, uh, Stable Studio, the REST API, the platform documentation. Um, when we see weird you know, behavior in the APIs, just Generally, when external developers are trying to interact with our stuff, um, usually me and the group of people I work with is involved. Um, and my first day of stability was back on August 22nd of last year, which is the launch day of the first model. And uh, it's been just about as crazy ever since the launch day. <laughs> and, uh, you know, today is another launch day. So um, quite exciting. Um, so, yeah. Um, so stability is is really unique and I'm glad I'm talking to a group of people that's it's very interested in like the startup aspect of things like using this stuff for the purpose of of creating businesses because I, I think the way we work is is very different from you know interacting with something like an open AI or um, really any of these proprietary model makers um, we have a lot of models so you know there's SDXL which just came out um, there's music generation models in the works uh, I I can't talk too much about them, but I'm really hoping that we'll see like another stable diffusion moment um, out of those models where they're pretty good uh, and it's it's all trained on data we can use. And I, I think you're going to see another explosion uh, kind of the same way you did with image models. So um, stable OM is something we've been working on. It's taken a lot of different names right now, but like the, the latest iteration of the language models has been uh, the Free Willy project, which was like on top of the leaderboards recently. Uh, for open LLMs. Um, video generation, um, man, the community is like going fast on this too. So needless to say, like that space is also pretty ripe to explode. But um, a lot of these models we're working on, um, they're really hard to get right. And when we do these releases, the, the goal is to create kind of like that original stable diffusion moment where it, it, it serves as this foundation for the rest of the community and this open source foundation where it's very hard to predict really what happens next with these models. And that's something I want to dig into um, as we go through this, like why that's such a key difference um, between how stability operates and a lot of other um, model making companies effectively. Uh, so there's a lot of ways to interact with our models. Um, the way I'll be mostly showing you today is the platform we have um, and basically the, the overall API you can use to access this stuff on our hosted inference. Um, it's it's cheap, uh, so that's something I want to point out. Uh, the platform API is pretty dang optimized. Um, we've got good deals with Amazon, so if you're looking to basically go zero to one in incorporating generative AI into your stuff, uh, and it's a feature we serve with the API, um, yeah, that's that's going to be like the cheapest and fastest way to start serving stuff at scale. Um, I, I do want to mention like what's so cool about using our API again it goes back to being open source is that a lot of people find building a company on top of a proprietary API like that is really dangerous. And, you know, like, what if we need to switch off? What if we need to um, modify things in a way that, that we can't with the API you have? Well, you know, we have these models on the open. You can always do your own inference. So there's this level of safety there. And you can build on top of these APIs knowing that you, you basically have an exit. And we're going to be trying really hard to make sure you don't by making the APIs better, faster, and cheaper than you can uh, sort of create them yourself. But it really, if you're trying to start a company 
that needs some of these features, like that, that's a really unique advantage. Like if, if you're building on top of ChatGPT APIs, um, good luck, you know, trying to get, look under the hood there. You, you can't run that yourself. You can't use that inference. So when talking about all these proprietary things we do, I just want everyone to kind of remember that. Um, that's just something I think is pretty unique to, to what we do. So um, we've also been working with uh, Amazon specifically. That's like our preferred compute provider. So there's a couple of ways to actually interact with Amazon and the stuff we have there. There's Bedrock, so that's serving containers um, we create. So you can actually do the inference in your account. Um, this is pretty good uh, if you're if you're really worried about private data and basically data leaving the your accounts. Um, and it's kind of like a set, stepping stone on the path to running your own inference if that's something you ever needed to do. Um, there might also be in the future situations where we work with partners that have private data, such as let's I don't know, let's say some major content uh, provider of some popular TV show wants to have a model with data that we can actually share the the training for and the weights for, but we can allow you to run that model and license it. That's something we're thinking about doing too. And you know, Bedrock's a really awesome you know, service for that sort of model. Um, yeah, there's options. And again, if you want to run this stuff on your own, that's that's there for you. The community is moving fast, you know. Um, so yeah, um, we just put out a new uh, version of our platform site and that's what I'll actually be going through a little bit with everyone a bit uh, later, showing you where everything is, sort of how it's laid out, um, giving you a sneak peek, uh, sneak peek of the fine tuning API. Um, but this is pretty new. We're gonna make a lot of improvements here over time. Um, like a lot of stuff we do, it's open source too. So even if the samples you're seeing aren't the best yet, or you're just like, how does this actually work in the UI? It's open source. Um, everything you see on our platform site, you can just go look at the GitHub repo. We need to make better readme's for it. Um, we need to get it in a, in a better state uh, so people can contribute to it. Um, but that's pretty exciting. Like everything you see here um, is actually out there in open source. So um, there's a lot of these sandboxes we've created where you can test one of these features out. Um, and actually see the code you would need basically on the left-hand side to replicate that same functionality, which is pretty cool. Um, so that's what we're gonna go through uh, a little bit later in sort of the deep dive portion. Um, and yeah, I've been talking a lot about this, but I, I don't know, I just really wanna hammer this home. Uh, to my knowledge, especially in image at least, you know, there, there really aren't competitors on this front, you know, making these state-of-the-art models that you really do get to own. Um, the licenses, Creative ML, are really liberal. They're not like the uh, the Llama 2 licenses that say like if you get to 700 uh, million users or more, you have to not use this. Uh, please get to that uh, amount of users and be using our APIs. That would be wonderful. But um, but yeah, that's that's just something that's pretty unique about basically how stability operates. Um, and then. I think this is gonna become a bigger thing over time, but the fine tuning APIs we actually provide, I'm, I'm pretty excited about. Fine tuning is tricky. Uh, you know, everything from labeling your data correctly to knowing how to like get the biggest bang for your buck, getting the inference to be efficient. So it's not just fine tuning the model. Once you have a custom fine tune, you need to run it very efficiently, which is, is not trivial. Uh, so what's nice about using these APIs is that once you've done these fine tunes, you get to basically benefit from all the tricks stability has been uh, working on forever now to make just it as cheap as possible to do image generation. So um, that's something I'm I'm really excited about. I think our fine tuning API will grow beyond image and, uh, and yeah, be something we, a lot of people end up leveraging, especially if you are just really interested in building a killer product and don't have time to like get into the nitty gritty of like training LoRa's and trying to figure out inference at scale, like it is tricky. Um, so yeah, I think that will lead us right into our little demo here. Um, but first there's some resources here you might be interested in, in viewing, uh, just obviously our website, a great place to play around with stuff where you can actually like see how this works in a consumer product is Dream Studio. Um, Dream Studio is, basically open source. We have a version of it now called Stable Studio. That's like the hosted version we have, but everything's stripped out 
um, from the backend perspective and kind of re-implemented as plugins. So even that interface itself is open source. Um, ClipDrop has a lot of functionality. We're going to start adding into the main platform APIs as time goes on. And then, yeah, I think just checking out our GitHub and looking around is a good move. Uh, just today, we open sourced a new project called Stable Swarm, uh, which is a, a UI that tries to optimize over a bunch of GPUs um, and is basically built for local inference. So uh, all of that's worth checking out. Uh, maybe take a screenshot or I think we'll share this slide. But um, yeah, that's uh, I think that concludes the actual presentation part. Um, do we want to stop here and maybe answer any questions before getting into the uh, the demo itself or anything you want to call out in particular, uh, Laura? Nope. Okay. Cool. I had All a right, quick cool. question, if you don't mind, before you, sure. before yeah. you move on. Um, so if any other folks have any questions, feel free to uh raise your hand in zoom or um or you know send a message in the chat but um uh, i'd love if you could talk a little bit more about sdxl for anybody who hasn't seen it yet um like what are what is it you know kind of how is it different from stable diffusion well it's a lot bigger <laughs> that's that's in the name you can kind of guess that but it is just a much larger model um so sdxl has kind of two big components to it um the base model and the refiner a lot of what's gone on there is some really interesting tricks. I, I think one of the coolest parts of XCSL, SDXL, of a mouthful, um, is the tuning that's been done on a lot of different components of just like what's aesthetic. Um, it's actually a model that's been trained to know for a given aspect ratio, for instance, what looks good. Um, you'll see a lot of our older models and just models in general will sometimes like weirdly zoom in. You'll ask for a picture of a horse, and it'll be like the nose or something, you know. Just like that's not framed well. It knows kind of aesthetically how things should be framed, which is just a very cool um, capability in general. Uh, and it's a model that's been influenced by a ton of feedback from the community through the free bots we run on the Discord server. And future versions are going to be trained on even larger volumes of data we get um, from just a number of sources that there's tons of signals for this all over the place. Like if you are generating four images and you upscale one of them, that's a pretty strong signal that of the four, one was better. And that that is something we can feed back into the model and, and help uh, make better and better, uh, especially now that uh, SDXL is released also. We expect there to be a pretty large explosion in the amount of fine tunes available. And that's something we're really eager to work with people in the community on as well as people who have big data sets that are good clean data sets and increase the performance in one area can actually be merged back into the base over time to just make a more capable model. Um, and then, yeah, obviously the images are just way bigger. Um, well, you know, twice as wide and large. The 1024 aspect ratio, uh, as we, like the new base is, is kind of a big deal. Uh, you, you kind of get that upscaling um, quality without having to do an upscale, uh, which is just awesome. It's harder to run on consumer hardware, but definitely not impossible. And I think in, I mean, I've run it on my MacBook. It just takes a long time. Um, and that's that's where the APIs we have step in. So, you know, we have this open model you can run. Uh, my MacBook takes like 700 seconds to, in its unoptimized form, get an image out of it, which is just bad. Um, I think production is serving like the four images within 20 seconds right now. Um, and at a crazy low cost, honestly. So it's... Uh, hopefully going to represent a, a new base for fine tuning efforts and just the community going forward. Uh, Stable Diffusion 1.5 really represented that. Um, historically, that's kind of like the model everyone based their fine tunes on. And we're really hopeful this one is going to be sort of like the new standard in fine tuning. Very cool. Connor, if you go next. <clears throat> There should be a teaser or like a video put together for S SDXL 1.0. Uh, I can't click forward. Or you might need to refresh. Um, I just added it. Okay, cool. I wanted to append it after. Yeah, there we go. Oh, yeah, there we go. Sweet. You could put the sound on too. Look at that. And then some images are after that. Let me know if the sound is coming through. No sound coming uh -huh. through? No, I don't think it it's is. okay. I think to... It's okay. 
It's fine. All right. Yeah. Yeah. We'll run through some of the examples. Um, yeah. I mean, it's just a crazy model. Like I, um, I don't know. I, my first day of stability again was like that first day of stable diffusion being launched. So from in less than a year, it feels like we really are solving image. Uh, and something you'll notice is that it's just really good at following the prompts. You know, you're not having to do like quite as much trickery because there's basically a language model built into it. Um, it just works pretty well. And I'll show you one of my better generations um, after this. This is actually from the, um, the beta model. But yeah, same same general premise. Um, the the actual like prompt length can get way longer too, which is really nice. Um, not sure what we are sure enough here. Yeah, this is um this is stuff I'm actually surprised is uh out there in public. So there's there's research we're doing in in, in 3D that's exciting. Um, and yeah, I I'm just hoping in more of these modalities you will start to see it like a stable diffusion moment is kind of what. What I refer to it as these these base models go out that everyone can use, fine tune, and and grow capability on. Uh, you know, like once one of these models drops, uh, everybody collectively on Earth with a graphics card just got more creatively capable. So that's that's just awesome. Uh, sorry, I had the three D was there. Um, we had put animation. I just linked that one as well. Um, so if you refresh the animation should be there too. But that was just a preview, a quick preview of the, oh. the animation. Yeah. Is the animation available now as well? Yep, it's in the API. Mm. And it's very similar to Deform if you've ever worked with Deform for animation. Um, I think they're gonna be updating it to use the new model, but I'm not sure if that's available yet. Damn. Pretty cool. Uh, I don't think you guys have audio, so um, we'll link to these videos because I think they're on our YouTube um, a little bit later. But yeah, um, that is that is the presentation part. Um, Go already. We can kind of talk about the platform site and a really quick zero to one on getting started. Um, so yeah, let's jump right in. This is a pretty new site, and again, the uh, we need to do some cleaning up here of the actual repo. But everything you're going to see is open source. Like, yeah, that's embarrassing. We just launched it last week. New model came out. Uh, we'll get around to that on my on my list. But this is all open source. So if you see anything on here and you're you're wanting to know like how we did that and how the API works for it, um, you can just go look. So, um, but yeah, so we have some sandboxes now. Um, all of our documentation here. Um, is is up to date. The uh, we've got some new pricing calculators. I'll walk through, but I'm kind of going to come at this from the perspective of zero to one. Let's get started. Um, if you're creating a new account, you can kind of do it with whatever social login you like using. Um, I'm going to quickly delete my shy keys and then recreate them because uh, I'll probably expose some during this chat. Um, but you can come here and manage. You know, like if you need to delete stuff, there's there's billing. Um, this is really what most of you are going to be interested in getting. Just like every API, you'll need a key to get uh, started with it. And once you have that, um, you're basically off and running. As soon as you have that key available, you can come into these sandboxes and just actually try stuff out. So I don't know. What do we want to see? I have a big Rhodesian Ridgeback, so I want to see what that looks like. Do, do, do. We should update that to be the NIST model. But yeah, you can actually run these um, queries here and you'll see on the left-hand side, like the exact same code you'll need to, to perform, you know, the generation. So if you're looking for like a very fast way to get up and running and just have generative stuff in your apps, um, this, is, this is the way to go. And we've got a couple of these now that are interesting. So just some are real simple, like upscaling, uh, how to make one of those requests. There's examples in Python too. Um, we have oops, the one I'm going to show you in a bit. And uh, sort of at the end of this is the fine tuning sandbox. Just a sneak peek of that, um, and that's that's going to be exciting. Um, but yeah, so any anything you see on here, um, we've got these live examples for, and you can kind of jump in and immediately use something. Um, I'll also mention is that this is kind of like a stripped down version of Dream Studio. So once you have those credits. Um, 
or your, your account created, the same account will work here on Dream Studio. Um, hopefully I wasn't gener generating anything too crazy. I was testing our, our in-painting feature. So yeah, you can you can in-paint pretty pretty well. Um, we have a whole editor in here where you can mess around and you know remove things out of paint. And all of this functionality is is basically open source in the uh, the same place. So if you go, oops, um, to the stable studio, same organization on GitHub, but the open source variant is called um, Stable Studio. So this is kind of going to evolve over time into, we're not really sure what yet, but um, we're working on making it desktop installable and powered by Comfy UI, which the creator of Comfy UI now works for stability. So um, I'll link to some resources on that if you're interested more in the local inference side. Um, but all of that functionality you'll see in Dream Studio, you can come to that repo and check out for yourself too, if you're like trying to do more advanced stuff like in painting, et cetera. Um, yeah, let's hop back into the platform site um, and talk about pricing real quick. Um, we've just added these new pricing calculators so you can kind of see um, how much this stuff actually costs uh, ahead of time. And again, it's, it's I would say pretty cheap if you consider the actual cost of running a GPU yourself, hour by hour, even on demand right now, it's really hard to get GPUs. Um, and anything you want to generate that we could think to put a formula here for, we did so you can kind of get an understanding of what your cost is going to be um, ahead of time. So this is a, a nice new resource. Um, credits can be bought on the site or on Dream Studio. They're both kind of the same system overall. And um, yeah, there's a lot more information here too that I'm not going to get into uh, in too much detail, but I wanted to point out like a lot of our docs exist here. Well, basically all of them. Um, and, and something you're going to notice is that we're sort of in this transition from our gRPC based APIs into REST APIs. Um, so if you're somebody who's specifically interested in working uh, with our REST API, you'll find like auto-generated docs here for that that go beyond the sandbox examples. But um, we're going to be adding more functionality to these REST APIs over time um, beyond the gRPC, which is a little tricky to work with. And if you are one of the people who wants to help us make that API better and give us feedback, I really want to talk to you. So um, anybody trying to get integrated with that, definitely feel free to reach out. So, um, but yeah, in general, this is where you're going to find all your basic information about getting authenticated and whatnot. Um, and yeah, that's, um, that's kind of a brief overview of the, the new platform site. That's awesome. Um, I have a quick question. So you mentioned we can download, um, what was it called? Stable, uh, stable studio. Is that right? Yes. Like a, a local version. So when you're running that locally, um, I I'd love for you to expand on what can be run on, you know, consumer hardware. Like I have an M1 Mac and I just download it and run stable diffusion locally. Um, and, and what stuff kind of can't run on that. Right. The, um, I'll point out real quick, uh, let's go to Kaj's. Uh, my coworker is working right now on a version of Stable Studio. I want to point out, this is kind of like, hush, hush, it's not ready yet, but you can go look at the branch. Again, it's open source. All this development happens out in the public. Um, that's basically a wrapper around Comfy UI. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Comfy UI, um, it's what we're really starting to push as like, kind of an automatic 11 replacement, mainly because it's just so extensible. Um, you can define these crazy workflows that are basically just JSON, um, feed that to the Comfy UI server. And what we're doing with Stable Studio is basically just making it so that it installs those things. Uh, they're easy to use without having to set up a Python environment to all this stuff. But you get that nice sort of for um, wide generation um, occurring, and then also the full power of Comfy. So, you know, you, you can see here the really nice, easy to use, um, you know, Dream Studio type UI, which my internet was working. Uh, I want to show you the nodes. Um, and now there's this new nodes view, which uh, you can actually get in there and modify pretty much everything you could. Uh, everything you could in Comfy UI is, is right there for you to 
to tweak and mess around with. So you actually get that look under the hood. And this is all running locally. So you do need some beefy hardware. In the, that is the name of the game. Good graphics cards uh, matter. So SDXL is a big model. I, I don't think it'll be long before you see a lot of optimization starting to occur on that the same way we saw with 1.5 and other earlier uh, versions, but it is big. It's it's uh, it, just in terms of the weights, like what it's actually doing. Um, it's a multi-stage generation process. Uh, you should expect some pretty slow generation times like on a Mac, but it still works on a Mac. Um, and that's that's pretty exciting. Like we, we do really try to make sure that these models are not your GPT-4-esque models that you, you're pretty much never going to have a chance of running that on consumer hardware. That's not what it's designed for. Um, these are these are really built to be stuff that can run on individual laptops, uh, individual computers. Maybe not fast. If you went fast, you can use the API and you'll get images back real quick. Um, but but yes, uh, a lot of consumer hardware will be able to run this. Fine tuning it might be a little bit more tricky. Um, but in general, if, if you've got a good gaming computer, I think you should be fine. Awesome. All right. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of an overview of all the features that are out there now. Um, it's not really a full overview. Like, there's a lot going on here. Actually, like how you do in painting and masking is really cool. If I want to remove like a a head and replace it with something, um, somebody we talk with a lot, uh, my designs, I think, but it's it's a website that makes basically custom stickers for people. And they have an entire business around basically generating stickers and then also putting them into physical print. And that's done with sort of this whole stack of um, inference tricks, in painting, masking, um, cutting stuff out, the ability to now use something like segment anything and provide a mask the exact way you need it uh, and feed that into the API. You can really stitch together these features in quite a lot of interesting ways. Um, so I encourage you to kind of think of these things almost like primitives. And I'll also go ahead and call out ClipDrop, um, which is a company um, we acquired back, uh, man, it's been a while now, but we're slowly merging everything together into this one sort of cohesive experience. And they have a lot of really powerful um, APIs that are worth looking into as well. So similar sort of things like in painting, but stuff like remove backgrounds really cool. Um, replacing a background, uh, surface normals, the depth estimation is actually really useful for generating masks. So um, they do some interesting stuff there as well that's you know worth pointing out. Um, yeah, let's go ahead and uh, show what the fine tuning stuff is gonna look like. I'm going to stop my screen share just so I don't do anything wacky uh, while I get the demo up and running. Um, one moment. So this is, um, the goal here with the fine tuning sandbox is, and I'm really just going to show you the UI, UI for it, and then probably just some examples because um, it's in flux right now. Like we are updating it to use 1.0, so you get the best quality model we can possibly give you. But I just want to kind of give you what to expect from it. Uh, so one moment, we'll get that back up. There we go. All good. Um, so yeah, I, I was working on um, basically something we could have as a demo for random stability events. And I had like a kind of crazy set of requirements for myself. I wanted to have basically a, a little grid of the world, like a terrain generated map that was modified over time by ChatGPT. So it could say like this grid has a lot of population. So the city grew or like a farmland popped up next to it. And I wanted to be able to feed that rough approximation of the world into um, into stable diffusion and get like photorealistic satellite imagery out of it. So I wanted to show you how badly that went um, at first. So my first attempt at this, um, this is about how far I got. Um, I had created, this was all in JavaScript and on the front end, this grid, it was generating the terrain. I had to blur it to get that really nice initial image. And uh, again, that's that's just a feature you can use in the API. Um, so my goal here was to basically take an existing image and actually the best way to show this to you is Dream Studio. Um, so like, let's say we wanted to create variations of this. 
Um, notice how there's that image strength over there. That's what I mean by initial image. It's just taking an initial image, using it to, to sort of guide the next image that comes out. That's how we power variations. So pretty simple. The goal is to take this, um, this sort of like satellite rough image and turn it into something photorealistic. I mean, that's okay. Yeah, you know. So this is where fine tuning actually really becomes powerful. Um, to get that actual satellite photorealistic effect, um, what I ended up needing to do is, let me actually just search for that. There we go. I just went to Google Earth and I uploaded, um, or actually went in, just screenshotted a bunch of different, you know, images of satellite uh, random places, you know, like I wanted to give the model a good idea of what satellite imagery looks like. I wanted to give it a, a sense of what what I was going for. So instead of just that initial image and a prompt, you really actually change the model uh, in, a, in a very direct way and modify its behavior. Um, so that's what our fine tuning uh, UI is all about. Again, still in progress. So you're seeing the, uh, you know, the, the development of it. But for this example, I was using a style fine tune. Um, and for the uh, style fine tune, like you're talking 15 to 20 minutes of training once you've uploaded your images. And that's something we're gonna be working on getting faster and faster as time goes on. Um, we can do faces, uh, we can do objects, uh, but in this case, it's a style fine tune. And basically it's as simple as um, you go and do -do, pick a zip. And all you need is a couple images. I, I have a lot here actually, but um, once, once your images are actually uploaded and that's happening right now, kind of behind the scenes, once it's done, uh, we'll be able to hit train. Um, you start training a model. So that that process takes about five, um, 10 minutes. Again, that, that, that's gonna go down in, in, in time over time. But the goal is you now have this, um, you now have this version of stable diffusion that's like uniquely good at the, the data set you're providing to it. Um, so, and then you wait, and I think right now I have this like hard coded to, to jump. Uh, so it is triggering it, but I don't have like the, there's gonna be a models page where you can delete, rename all of that for the models you have. Uh, but the important part is, let's see if I can run that collab notebook. Uh, yep, this is, um, this is my manager, Elliot. Uh, it's been fine tuned on him. And you end up getting this, um, this model ID you can just pass into the API and use for um, use for generation. So um, that's that's just awesome. So you don't really have to have any labeling for your data, um, any examples uh, beyond what you upload really. And you end up with um, stuff that runs at the same inference speed as something like Dream Studio. So without having to go through that entire pipeline of curating data, um, you know, figuring out how to serve a model that you fine tune, you're going to be able to just go to the platform site, upload some photos and um, start serving a fine tune model. Um, and I think that's about all I can show of it right now. Um, I was going to, let me stop my screen share and open up the, uh, the public examples folder um, outside of the actual code. I can kind of show you what's going on there. Do you, uh, do you have any results you can show us from that model, by the way, after you fine tuned it? Like um, what did it, the satellite imagery? Did yeah, it, let me, did it improve? Oh yeah. Um, it, I mean, it wasn't perfect. So, uh, let me, let me open that up real quick. My downloads folder is, is expansive. Uh, so I have to make sure there's nothing, nothing crazy in there. I can't show off. Um, yeah, I'll give you some examples of what that, that fine tuned it because, uh, did a really good job. So one moment. Yeah, that sounds super convenient, though. You know, you have a model that's not performing exactly what you want. And so you feed it like 20, 30 images, wait 10 minutes, and all of a sudden you have this, wow. Yeah, and this is, okay. I didn't try very hard at this prompt either. Like, this is a really basic prompt. Uh, so, you know, a small city from above, right? You know, I didn't even give it that many examples of city. I could probably, if I wanted to create a couple models, like a fine tune on cities, a fine tune on desert. Uh, 
So you can kind of choose the granularity. The cost for this, by the way, is something in the order of like 30 to 300 credits, depending on um, what, how many images you're training and what kind of thing you're training, which is really not expensive. It's like um, four big, big images will be 30 credits. Uh, I think it's, 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 it's basically a really small cost is what I'm trying to get across and you get pretty amazing results without having to do any of this manual fine tuning. Uh, so like rolling hills, sparse uh, farmland, you know, a small city. Uh, let me see if I can't find the Amsterdam example. A gigantic metropolis, you know, so you can kind of see like more of an industrial vibe to it, um, which I just thought was awesome. So, and, and what was really cool is that it got some, it, it's not just, um, you know, it's not just the fine tune images, right? It's all of SDXL. So it's seen Amsterdam, it's seen Paris, it's seen enough satellite imagery to sort of get an idea of what these things look like. And it has an idea of what Amsterdam looks like. So yeah, it's got some of the red roofs you'll see there and the canals. Um, so all of, you don't need to actually impart this knowledge from scratch. Again, it's just fine tuning what it already knows uh, in a certain direction. Uh, so this is actual Amsterdam, you know, uh, a lot of those red roofs. Um, I didn't put Amsterdam into my fine tune data set, but it still was able to kind of get it basically. Um, and we're a big fan, uh, big fans of training on pets. So let me see if I can't pull that up too. I think that's going to be a pretty, um, a pretty compelling use case. So give me one moment there and I'll find some of those for you. But yeah, I'll take a, any other questions you have while I get to that, I'll, I'll, I'll try to rush here. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to jump in. I'm kind of monopolizing the conversation. Um, a good question. But, uh, on that. Um, yeah, go ahead. Take on uh, Thanks. Uh, uh, we, uh, we are pretty much on the e-commerce and uh, food tech space, and we do use uh, some of the enhancements that you laid out here, right? Especially uh, when our customers do upload uh, their images uh, for the product or pretty much or any of the widgets they really want to enhance on their website. So we do use, uh, you know, one of your models, especially the upscaling part uh, and, and also the background removal. But uh, over the time, right, what happened was that we were eventually running those models within our AWS account and running it you know, rather than using APIs because we needed to update a few things. Uh, as our customers do upload images pretty randomly, like, you know, with the one is to one or very, very um, big size images that definitely has challenges for us. So we do one step at a time where we remove the background, then we go ahead and do the upscaling part. Or then finally we suggest them what is the background color they probably need to pick uh, for those kind of images, right? Uh, so we have done a lot of this work, um, updating your models, a couple of models and then running it locally. I mean, when I say locally, it's running in our AWS accounts. But uh, you know, uh, is there uh, is there any kind of uh, possibility where uh, we probably can uh, uh, you know uh, show you some of the things that we have done, and maybe uh, you guys can incorporate into those eventually those that we can consume it directly rather than running it locally from our side. Yeah, that's that's something we're really interested in is uh, use cases we aren't covering. Uh, quite yet. There's been a lot of focus in recent weeks and months on SDXL and getting inference better and um, like things like control net, uh, things like getting masking and outpainting just to be really dead simple and the rest API is something we're starting to ramp up on. So use cases that if you have a feature where it's like, man, this is something annoying that we're having to do and mm -hmm. it would just be nice to give you data in this format. And on our end, that's, that's not that crazy big of an ask and would enable like a whole new kind of use case or um, you know, some some business strategy that just isn't possible otherwise, like definitely want to know about it. Um, I, I will mention the bedrock strategy is, is maybe a good option too, where um, using Amazon's bedrock service, I'm trying to see if there's a link to it in here. Um, here we go. You can use it on both SageMaker and bedrock to actually run these models in your account too. Um, and actually still get like a, the benefits of not having to worry so much about figuring out inference, but it's actually in your backend. You know, it's, it's in your account inside your firewall. Yep, um, yep. So I'd really recommend, uh, there's links to that on the blog post from SCXL one today that are definitely worth checking out. 
Yeah, it was not like uh, crazy changes on our end uh, to pretty much uh, solve for our use cases. But what I can do is that I probably will share those information to you. Uh, maybe you can uh, evaluate those. You know, one other, for example, right, uh, we uh, we spin up uh, uh, stored friends for restaurant side, right? Uh, and especially the images, uh, we have tons of data, especially about all the food images like pizzas, you know, for sushi food and everything. So we feed those images to your API and make it enhance it, upscale it, and then pretty much launch their website programmatically within 10 seconds. So uh, the, some of the changes that we've done, probably, you know, I'll try to share this uh, information to you guys after this. Yeah, great. And I'll just mention in general for, uh... Basically, everyone on this call and who's actually building businesses on top of this stuff, uh, I'm very keen on making sure that anything you run into that that is not fun to work with, or you're like, man, I want X thing, um, I want to know about that. So um, if, if you do run into like issues or just basically a wish list, uh, that's that's very, very interesting stuff. And uh, yeah, we, we try to, we've been really focused on serving these base models for a while. And I think that's something like we're just going to be branching out a lot more into is making sure that a lot of these use cases that, you know, if we just had control net or if we just had blink, more people would end up using the API. Um, we want to get those right because it, genuinely, I think there's going to be this GPU crush uh, that starts just accelerating. And uh, I'm, I'm proud of our prices, basically. Um, it's crazy. You can just sort of summon images from nothing for, for what it costs. Like it, it just is absurd. Um, so yeah, uh, let us know. And, please reach out awesome well we're approaching time but i think we can fit in one more question does anybody have one i have one myself so i'm gonna hop in if nobody does all right i guess i'll hop in myself so um yeah i'd love if you guys supported control net personally i i'm using so i'm building this product called room gbt on the side um, which uh, I actually just hit 2 million users yesterday. Um, but I, I originally started out using Stable Diffusion with it, uh, but it didn't keep the original structure of the room the same. Like basically the way Room GPT works, you upload a, a picture of a, a of a room, you give it some themes, and then it generates a, a new room based on that. Uh, but Stable Diffusion didn't do a great job in keeping the original structure. So I switched to ControlNet and uh, that worked out really, really well. Um, so that's definitely something I'd, I'd consider, you know, using Stability's API for if if, if you guys supported it. Um, and then I'm I'm exploring your your in painting and in masking Stable Diffusion, um, uh, basically APIs because that's that's like one of the number one probably the number one request I have is like after I generate a room, can I change like a couch here? Can I do this? Um, so so I'm exploring some of those APIs, which has been which have been just really, really awesome in general. Um, I guess my my question was, uh, do you have any like favorite applications of Stable Diffusion that you've seen? You've probably seen like thousands of projects at this point. Do, do any like stand out to you? Favorite applications? I, I think what people are doing in personalized, the, it's not really an application that I can point to and say this exists right now, but I'm like really confident somebody's going to build it and they're going to nail it. And it's just not quite there yet. But I do think we are going to shift away from this sort of model of the internet where a lot of people have pre-made products and they're trying to advertise your attention towards what already exists and more towards this model of like the websites will know you and sort of generate content that is good for you on the fly, you know, whether that's like both memes and entertainment or uh, in some cases, things like t-shirts and like the, the stickers example is something I, I, I thought was really cool. Um, but I think, I think, Fine tuning is going to really unlock use cases that people, you know, just I'm really bullish basically on the idea that fine tunes are going to get faster and faster and faster. And like your personal data set moving around with you, that's something we're seeing in the community. Like people hoard and, you know, accumulate these data sets that they fine tune on and make these models that are really personalized to them. And I just feel like that's something that over time, if you want to invest in capabilities that make it so that the content you're showing are more like tailored toward that individual person, those are the things that I find the most interesting. Like the Linza was a great, I think one of those great examples of a consumer app that just came out of nowhere because it's, it's like fundamental premise was like, here's some custom tailored content, like unique to you. And all of those use cases I think are great. The ability to like see how something would look in your house, like, uh, that that sort of stuff I I really appreciate. Um, 
from more of like the commerce side, but um, in terms of actual use cases, um, man, I think the I think the image like the video models we're gonna see coming out are what I'm most excited about. I guess coming forward, like it's it's still not quite image generation, but bringing like old pictures to life is something I'm obsessed with. Like um, trying to make it so you can really connect with just this past you've never seen before. I, I look at those where people upscale, colorize with control net. Uh, and then now they're starting with like runway to actually bring those alive for a couple seconds at a time. I think that's just crazy. Like bringing historical figures and these like past moments back to life is, is just crazy cool. Uh, so kind of a long winded answer, but I, I don't know. Those, those have gotten me excited pretty recently. So yeah. Very cool. Um, well, we're going to run through a quick question in the chat and then I think Raju has his hand up. So we'll run through these really quick and then, uh, and then end the call if that's okay. If, if you have a couple extra minutes. <laughs> awesome. So Alex in the chat says, uh, so you're a platform engineer at stability and, uh, at stability AI, your APIs keep evolving as you ship new features. So how do you help your users keep up with all these new releases? Yeah, there's two answers to this on the actual platform side, like API features. Um, we do have a change log on our platform site and we do have like a blog um, that that's out there for like just general announcements. That's a pretty good resource for things that we serve via the API. Uh, let me actually link you to the um, release notes uh, blog. We have also a lot of these uh, repositories are open source. So if you want to just watch and subscribe to updates in these repositories, um, you won't miss a beat. Um, but that's that's for stuff we serve. The other part of this question is like, how do you keep up with just movement in the image generation space in general? Like SCXL got launched today. It is impossible to predict what people are going to do with it, like even tomorrow. Um, I don't have a good answer for that. Uh, I'm basically Twitter uh, following Finding people on Twitter who are actively doing work in the space and, you know, just watching what they do closely, because uh, sometimes you'll have just wild advancements come out of unexpected places. And on the open source side and on the community side, I, I think that's one of the most exciting things about what Stability does is that we will release these things. And once they're out there, it, really, that, that question is hard to answer. Like, how do you keep up with all of this stuff? Um, I would love to know. Um, my answer so far has been like find creators out there who are doing uh, interesting work with it and just, you know, internet stock them as much as possible because they, they produce some crazy, awesome stuff. Uh, love that. All right, Raju, close us out. Yeah, good question. I, I was uh, looking at the, the clip drop uh, uh, tools that are available. I'm just curious to know, like all this, do have open source as well, or are they pretty much uh, closed models here? Clipdrop uh, started out as an independent company, so a lot of what they've been doing, like in their backend and all of their their product itself, is is a you know is designed to be like a consumer facing uh, product. And there might be things like that. Stability keeps closed source. Like uh, Dream Studio is one of those examples where we took a closed source thing we had, our proprietary product, and open sourced it. That's not always going to make sense, um, especially if things like security are related. But I, I think over time, um, you're, you're probably going to see basically the same thing we've done with Dream Studio and other places. If it if it makes sense to open source it, we will. Uh, I can't really say I know anything in particular in ClipDrop is becoming open source or not. I do know that the team that works on ClipDrop is awesome and just they ship some really great stuff like Stable Doodle, Doodle just came out. Um, I'm always excited to see what they release. And we are kind of merging both the stability API and platform itself with Club Drop over time. Like that's gonna be that's gonna be one of the big things we're aiming to do in the near future. And so you'll, you you might see some stuff come out of that, but um, you know, in general, it'd be hard to say anything like particular in Club Drop is is or isn't gonna be open source. Um, but yeah, that's the general ethos, you know, if if we can effectively make a good feature that is open sourceable, the way we sort of try to monetize these things is doing it really fast and at scale. Mm -hmm. um, it, that so that makes sense um, for a lot of things. For some things, it doesn't. You know. Got it. Th thanks. Thanks, Connor. 
All right. Well, thank you so much, Connor and Lara, for, for coming out and for that wonderful presentation and answering all our questions. I appreciate it.